have to, I'm sorry, we're, let's try that again. The vagaries of uh, the uh, Bosch system here. Uh, I'd like to call the City of Lake Forest Park City Council Committee of the whole meeting for Monday, <clears throat> excuse me, May 22nd, 2023 uh, to order. Uh, and we're gonna start out with the adoption of the agenda. So, so moved. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, thank you everyone. The ayes have it. Any nays? I'm assuming. Um, none. And we have anybody online, Matt? I'm sorry, I can't see. So I know that Councilmember Cassover and Councilmember Bodie were considering it, but it's okay. Thank you very much. Uh, and we also have um, start out with citizen comments. Is, is there anyone that would like to make comment at this time? Matt, would you make the announcement for, I don't think we have anyone. No, there's nobody online, uh, Stringer, Deputy Mayor. Thank you very much, Matt. Okay, we have two items tonight. Uh, first item is the amendments to the tree code related to tree permits and right-of-ways, and Director Bennett is gonna be the lead on that. And the second item is, <clears throat> excuse me, continued discussion of governance manual. And I apologize, my allergies are crushing my throat here tonight. Oh, I'm sorry. Mr. Lebo. Thank you, As many of you know, I am a Sound Transit employee. And while I don't believe there's a direct conflict of interest with regard to the adoption of and discussion of the tree ordinance, it substantially affects the Sound Transit project that's proceeding on um, Bothell Way. So I'm going to recuse myself from the discussion and deliberation and voting on this ordinance. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Lebo. Um, we appreciate your consideration there and we're not taking action at this time, but really appreciate your thoughtfulness there. Director Bennett. Thank you, Deputy Mayor French. Um, I uh, just wanted to kind of remind council to start off with where we've been so far with this. You discussed it, uh, I believe it was earlier this month or late last month. Um, uh, we had a number of policy questions for you. Uh, and uh, based on that guidance we got, uh, we um, went from the sort of outline of a, of a potential ordinance to a, uh, a draft ordinance that you see on the screen there, uh, which we presented to the tree board to get some initial comments from them. And so uh, what I thought we could do is just, you know, walk through uh, the, the draft as uh, it, it been provided it. And uh, I, as we get to areas where there's, um, you know, seemed like there was some, you know, there, these were kind of significant comments from, you know, major comments from the tree board. I can, I can bring those to your attention. Um, as well as Councilmember Goldman, who was at the meeting um, and um, had a number of questions, which uh, you feel free to ask again here if uh, if you still feel feel like we haven't uh, addressed them completely. So, um, uh, and, and I guess the other item of overview is just to kind of uh, restate the problem we're trying to address here. We, we have two problems we're trying to address. Number one, we've had a longstanding lack of guidance from the uh, tree regulations related to just any kind of tree permit in the right-of-way. Uh, so, you know, we develop some practices in terms of how we treat them when it's just a private property owner who wants to remove a tree. And so we're trying to really just codify that and create a situation where staff uh, sort of knows what direction to go in. And, and in, in doing though, you, that, you, you do establish some policies that uh, or, or some, you know, questions about what is the city's policy. So I think it's uh, it, it's it's good to also be talking about this at this time, um, in a, uh, in parallel to the other problem we're trying to address, which is of course uh, the fact that we have major uh, improvements uh, proposed along uh, our rights of way, and we don't really have a way to uh, create a, a, a permitting. Um, process for something that involves a right of way and multiple uh, private properties. <clears throat> and this uh, proposed changes uh, would would address that uh, to a certain extent, but there still are a number of policy questions that I, I think tonight would be a good chance for you to sort of give us a sense of what you're thinking about. Um, so uh, with that, um, the the um, 
the, you know, uh, I think we could just walk through, there's a few definitions. You, you have the whole definition section from the tree regulations in here uh, with, so that you can, because some definitions are referred to uh, uh, in the new definitions that you'll see in track changes formatting. So we, we have basically have three sections that are affected, the definitions, the application, uh, submittal requirements, and then the uh, application approval requirements. Uh, and, and so I would um, suggest we just sort of walk through these and if necessary flip back and forth, but I, I think you can um, talk about them uh, uh, kind of uh, where they are in place and just uh, give you some background. And uh, you can uh, feel free to uh, um, bring your questions um, up in, as we are in those situations. Uh, or if you want to wait afterwards, if some things might be cleared up through the process of discuss, discussing them. Does that sound reasonable? Yes. Okay, well, I would suggest we um, turn to the, um, the the fifth page of the draft ordinance, uh, which is page seven of your packet. Um, and uh, this is really uh, a change so that, it, you know, that uh, City Attorney Pratt has suggested um, so we, we um, have specific definitions of each type of off-site um, planting um, uh, situation because some of them, uh, like the last one, are not really related to the, uh, the new permit we're proposing, which is a right-of-way uh, corridor project permit. Uh, but, but essentially, there's, there's not a lot changed here. And this language really has just been reformatted and then um, uh, addressing the... Uh, the what uh, what offsite planting um, means you know, they're basically the same. There was no really change of a, a language there. Was there city attorney Pratt? Okay. Um, and so um, if there's no questions about that. We could go on to page um, six of the document. Yeah. Riddle has a question. Oh, sorry. Let's go ahead. Just just a brief uh, comment more than question. I think that um, is there other language that is appropriate other than fee in lieu? Because I know that there's sort of a lot of history around that language and it didn't work out well the first time. I'm just curious if there's another uh, phrasing that would be appropriate and relevant in this situation. Um, sort of a general comment maybe you can think on. Thank you. Yeah, we'll give it some thought, kind of see if we can come up with something, some alternatives. Um, so then uh, on uh, the the definitions of uh, right-of-way corridor, right-of-way um, uh, replacement plan, right-of-way corridor, canopy replacement plan, and right-of-way corridor project, these are all, of course, related to that particular, that, that new type of permitting um, uh, process. And so the, this is a place where the tree board had a fair amount of discussion about Namely, you know, what is a thousand uh, feet linear corridor uh, the right the right width? A thousand feet on either side is which is how um, uh, I think we would interpret uh, this the, the way it's defined here. Uh, and, and we did since your discussion uh, add some that that part that's in red lines uh, set 16, 17, and eighteen, uh, which which kind of addresses the fact that the corridor would need to move uh, if it, parts of it are over water. So still probably need some refining, but uh, we're just trying to get at that. Um, but the, the the tree board comment was in relation to, well, if, if we want to use this process to target some some areas that we think are equally as important as the target, and that's as, as, the, um, as the corridor. And that of course is a, a kind of an essential question uh, for, for you. Uh, uh, then you're, you know, the in this case, the corridor is fairly underforested because it's near the water and views are important. Um, but if the um, if the goal is just to replace canopy and uh, be made whole from a canopy standpoint, uh, are these underforested areas that you have a, a map of that uh, um, one of our tree board members uh, put together? Uh, the, you know, that's sort of, it's very general at this point. I, I'm hoping we can get more specific, but is, is that an equivalent, equivalent goal or is it more important that the, the impact be mitigated in the corridor uh, that it's located? So, so your, the, the number we use um, definitely changes what's gonna happen there. So uh, as you see in that graphic um, that Doug put together, he, he shows um, the dotted lines along 
uh, the corridor. I'm looking at the, the second map. Uh, Matt, if you want to go to that one <clears throat> at the end of the packet. Um, and so he's Steve, you know, saying that. I don't know if our packet has, the, oh, they're the printed maps that we have. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, and he, he added it to the online packet as well. So it's pages uh, 19 and 20. So the, the second map, uh, now in addition to these four targeted areas, also shows um, roughly, um, you know, what uh, a 500 feet on each side corridor, how it compares with a thousand feet on, on either side. So, you know, I think from his perspective, uh, and, you know, I don't know that the whole tree board, you know, necessarily agreed and uh, Councilman Goldman, you can uh, weigh in if you think, uh, uh, you know, that there, there was or wasn't consensus on this, it, but it does, you know, kind of crystallize the issue. If, if uh, in corridor, you know, mitigation is the most important, then we stick with the thousand feet or something larger like that. If just getting canopy replaced and finding the best opportunities to do that is more important, then we might go with a smaller corridor and, 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 and give these uh, target areas equal weight in terms of replacement. So I guess any thoughts about that? Um, yeah, I have uh, two questions and a comment about uh, the questions about defining the width. So if there's a place where Lake Washington is 700 feet east of the right of way, does that mean the corridor would be 700 feet east and then 1300 feet west? So it's a total of 2000? Is that yeah, the, uh, the way I've tried to word it here is that the, the, the corridor would be get pushed out as soon as it starts to go over water. It could, it could push inward, I mean, and okay. uh, landward. And then next question, what if the 2,000 feet ends up including Shoreline or Kenmore, as is the case um, like south of Acacia Cemetery or like right on like the northeast edge? I, th I think we would limit it to uh, within the jurisdiction. Is that what you mean? Well, as in, would it... If, for instance, at the very south end by 145th Street, everything west of 522 is shoreline. So would, would that mean that it would extend 2,000 feet east of the highway to avoid shoreline, or would it just be the corridor would not be 2,000 feet wide? In yeah, that I, I, I think you know what the intention would be. Um, that the language doesn't reflect that yet. Would be that the corridor stops uh, at at whatever point the uh, the project stops. So. Uh, if it stops within the city, uh, then, you know, and, and there's 500 or 1,000 feet to go around the end of it, you might as well include it. Uh, but we could provide some clarifying language uh, on that if, because okay. uh, I, I agree that's, there's, it's kind of nebulous. Uh, but in this case, the project, of course, goes from city limit to city limit. So we didn't think about that. Right. And then the comment, um, yeah, the tree board was somewhat divided about whether a thousand feet on each side was too wide. Um, they're, they're hoping that their next meeting is June 7th. They might be able to vote on some specific recommendations at that meeting. I was also skeptical at first, though, looking at the map, I'm actually coming on board with the thousand feet, because if you look at that, I mean, that a thousand feet east and west does hit a lot of parcels that seem to be underforested. So at least as pertains to this project, um, I'm, I'm seeing some merit in, in having a wide, like the thousand foot corridor on each side. Okay. Oh. Thank you so much. Um, so kind of a question maybe for either of you. Uh, did the conversation around um, kind of equity across the city come up in the tree board discussion or any other discussions? And, and uh, what was the thinking behind that if it did come up? Um, I, I think this this was the, the what we were just talking about was kind of the nut of equity. The, the, I think tree board was not that concerned about but when you say equity, I assume you mean that, you know, the mitigation occurs where the impact occurs. Is that correct? Or, you know, we, we find that oftentimes we have low tree canopy covery, coverage and other areas of inequity, like, um, uh, you know, people, financial inequity and other things of that nature. Yeah. I'm sorry, my brain is just pausing there for a moment. No, so uh, other areas like, you know, maybe up uh, along Ballinger Way, closer to Shoreline where we have, yeah. you know, some apartments and things like that. So did, did that yeah. piece of the puzzle ever get discussed? Or I, is that I, I, from my perspective, it wasn't discussed in, in terms like that, but but there is an overlap between these areas that are under forested uh, and and the, like the corridor of the Ballinger corridor you're talking about. Uh, so it, that didn't enter into the tree board's conversation as I remember it, but uh, I don't know, what, what do you think, Councilor Goldman? 
Um, yeah, I, I would concur with Director Bennett in that there wasn't so much a discussion about, um, let's say, financial or racial equity, but it was more in the context of what neighborhoods are relatively unforested. And so if you look at the, the map, there's those four boxes numbered one through four. And this, again, this was the work of one tree board member um, as sort of like a proof of concept, but just it's, I would say it's representative of conversations the tree board has had. Like if you were to flip the map over to the, the yellow side, that's just density of canopy in general. And you can see there are definite areas that have relatively low canopy coverage. So I, I would say the tree board was focusing on what areas of the city are tree deficient. And if you were to also do a map of, let's say, demographics or median household income, I suspect you would see there's correlations between, you know, higher household income correlates with higher canopy coverage. So I think this sort of plan would also address your the, the sort of equity concerns you brought up. Thank you. I, I'm I'm thinking also out of the context of uh, Bothellway work. You know, when we do the 40th Street roundabout, that immediate vicinity is not seeing similar um, inequities right near that project site. So if we're doing right of way tree uh, removals in other areas of the city this map works for this particular project category, but it, it, I'm just curious if, if, if it's gonna work for all projects. It's something for us, I think, to muse upon as we move through this process. Okay. Thank um, you all. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, Director Bennett, please. Uh, yeah, um, i uh, hoping we can like just touch on uh, things in all the various sections, uh, but if there, now's a good time. If you had other quest questions about these other definitions, uh, I'm happy to try to address those. And if not, I would suggest we move to um, the, um, just pass the definitions into the next sections, which um, is getting into the, what, you know, what is, uh, uh, what is required for a permit application. Now the, there's really not a substantive change in this, um, on pages eight and nine of the uh, ordinance. The, these are just ways, the, the ordinance kind of um, you know, needed uh, some, I think the city attorney uh, offered this change on page eight to uh, just clarify that all of these things that are listed in one actually uh, apply to the whole thing, the whole section. And then on uh, page uh, nine of the ordinance, the uh, these these summaries of the permit, um, you know, they they can have a um, you know a policy effect, but they really we we really want to make the rest of the ordinance be reflected in these. This is just uh, the format of the ordinance. This is kind of organizationally it describes what each one of these things are. So the the devil is in the details, uh, and that you know we can come back to that if we find that they don't describe what goes goes on in these other parts. So. I'd suggest if you don't have questions about those two sections uh, that we move on to page uh, 10 of the ordinance. Uh, and, and so we have a change here from the uh, city arborist essentially saying add ICRZ as well as uh, CRZ, which is critical root zone versus interior critical root zone to these um, this, this permit requirement. And this is actually just for any kind of major permit uh, because we wanna make sure that the applicant's addressing that. So that's just a kind of a general improvement that uh, our city arborist um, recommended. Um, the next larger substantive issues um, can be found on page 11, which is where we describe what's required for this general right of way tree permit application. And so we're, um, what we're saying is that if you want to cut down a tree in the right of way, that you should um, provide a survey of where that, the location of, of that tree is just so we can all confirm that it is in the right of way. The basic stance is, the, you know, if the tree is growing in the right of way, it's the city's tree. And so we uh, have the right to require that someone, you know, prove that, uh, you know, that it, you know, first of all, it is in, in the right of way. And then if there are, if it's near a property line, uh, B comes into play, which is the uh, the property owner should, um, uh, if if anybody you know is near that property line, if it's it's if it's near a property line between two properties, they should also 
be aware. So they should all provide an authorization uh, that they're okay with cutting down that tree. Um, and we want to, so another policy uh, um, issue that uh, is coming up here in C is the canopy coverage study describing the projected canopy lost shall be required. So right now we're kind of, we're more like we, we say, you take down a tree uh, it's, uh, and uh, right away, it's sort of like a uh, level one permit or um, uh, the uh, minor permit. And then you just have to replace uh, the amount of canopy that was lost um, or more. Uh, so you, whatever, your whatever your listed tree is, it has to meet that. And, um, and then you, of course, provide a, uh, what, what that, you know, what that tree is going to be. And the arborist uh, doesn't necessarily have to review this, but, um, you know, if, it, it could get kicked into an arborist review if uh, you're not replacing the canopy. So that's, those are the application um, requirements for um, just the basic right-of-way tree permit. So any questions on that? And, and six, 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 six uh, I think, you know, um, why, why don't we focus on questions for five now, because six is the other is new application. And um, so does, is that pretty straightforward to folks that we basically treat this like a minor permit? Thank you. I, I think it's fairly straightforward. I, if I understand it, since six is for agency related, so this would be either uh, a developer or a private homeowner would right. be going for this uh, right away tree permit. Mm -hmm. um, do I guess part of me is wondering if this is a hardship for somebody to be able, in the, you know, to get the survey, the tree canopy coverage study. It all seems really um, a lot for some homeowners to 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 get. Um, is there a way that? I mean, if, if, if it's clearly not in anyone else's property, can they simply say, I, I, I acknowledge it's on city property and I'm going to follow this permit? What would be different versus them following a minor permit? I guess well, I'm trying to figure out, can they right, just say, so, yeah, I acknowledge it and I accept it. I don't want to do a survey because I accept it's there. Like, mm -hmm. is that viable? Yeah, I, 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 you have to look at what was the un underlying policy of the city. Are we... Uh, are we do we want to preserve the trees that are in the right of way? Is there anything wrong with this tree? So if there's something wrong with this tree, uh, then they they may not need it. If, if it's dying, they may be able to, uh, you know, cut it down without a permit. So so if it's a healthy tree, though, what's the city's or do we if people just are annoyed by the tree? Do we say, yeah, you know, just uh, I understand it's, you know, if, if, if first of all, you got to be, you know, the, the big cost is actually cutting it down. So, so that's, if, if they're willing to do that, then the, the permitting requirements and the survey probably aren't that big a deal. Um, and so, so we're, this is coming from the standpoint of, we think these trees in the right of way, they've gotten to the point, they're, they're significant trees, they're over eight, eight inches and they're viable, that you shouldn't cut them down. That's what this is saying. I don't know, I, I just have a concern that it's, it's overly, um, odious for someone to to go through as so just a general person you know it makes sense to us we do talk about these sorts of things all the time but um, you know what does it take you know survey putting together a site plan and that's that's not inexpensive yeah but the, the tree is not on their property that's I mean we're not asking them to do something um, you know that if it's on their property I would agree this would be pretty onerous <laughs> this is this is in the city right away it's, it may be, it may be in the unimproved right away, but it's part of the city's right away. So, but if they if they privileged. acknowledge that and they accept that, mm -hmm. accept it that that it's your that it's our tree, yeah. then they're accepting that they'll be part of this permit rather than a private ownership right uh, a minor permit or something. What is the difference at this point in this type of permit? What is the difference to that homeowner? It's simply a matter of what's the city's policy. Do, are the trees in the right of way of value to the city, or are they? Or do you want just to, the property owner to decide what their value is? Okay, but if they acknowledge it's in the right of way without a survey, then they've given us that authority over the tree without having to pay for a survey. They're not arguing that it isn't ours, and then we still have the authority to tell them 
what we want them to do with the tree. And if they turn around and go, okay, I don't like that. I'm going to get a survey. Maybe it's on my property, right? I, it, it reminds me of the time I was I went into a place that had that was serving alcohol and I was underage and they got mad at me because I didn't have my license with me. I said, but I admit I'm underage. Give me the underage stamp. I, I, I don't know why you're arguing about a license when I'm admitting that I'm not going to be able to get alcohol. And they were like, sort of blown away that I wasn't trying to sneak in and get alcohol. And they gave me the stamp. I didn't drink alcohol. We were good. I admitted to like the, the most, the, the more limiting case. Mm -hmm. And I apologize. That's not supposed to be on. Um, I, I guess I'm just trying to figure out if they say, yes, it's your tree. You tell us if you'll let us do that. Wh why are we making them jump through hoops? I, I, I'm asking, oh, well, honestly, yeah, why? Yeah, Maybe I, legally. Okay. Why. I, I think I follow what you're saying. And, and, you know, this, it's just a question of, you know, the, the, all the other criteria that is it a viable tree or not and that yeah. you know if if uh this so i, I don't know city Pratt, attorney pratt do you want to add to that i think um i would say many times it's not clear is the tree in the right away or not um or is is that on your boundary line or is that on your neighbor's boundary line a lot of times it's just not clear and so requiring you know one surveyed line to show if this is in the right of way or not, or if it's on your property or the or the neighbor's property. I don't know. I I in the draft, I thought that was um prudent to do um, when we're talking about taking down trees. And if you take down a tree, you know, a significant tree, the loss that you might incur. So given the uncertainty a lot of times about where a tree is, um, that's why I thought that was good to have in there because we would have the certainty. Um, depending on where the tree was, I would be nervous for a, an owner to say, let's just, we'll just say it's in the right of way. Well, I don't know. I don't know where your neighbor's boundary line is either. And so I would be nervous of the city taking on that liability. I mean, that's not every tree. I agree, but it's on a regular basis. I would say if you're doing, you're getting other permits on your property, you're going to have surveyed lines for the city to see anyway. I'm not sure. Sometimes it would be if if the only thing you're doing is taking out a right of way tree, maybe not. Yeah, that's, that's but I don't know why you would. I think that would be the le fewer cases where you'd be asking right. to take out a right of way tree and you aren't doing anything else, like putting in a new driveway or something like that. Okay. Interesting question. I mean, by way of example, the city's right of way. Uh, right here at the town center, most of the trees are within the city's right of way here. And it's kind of nebulous because it sort of bleeds into the town center zone with a slope here and the uh, the storage for um, our friends at um, uh, town center hardware. So um, I think it really needs to be, to both of your points, I think it really needs to be uh, ensured that the, that the property owner, if it's a citizen, is not encumbered by a really expensive kind of, you know, survey, et cetera. But at the same time, we need to make sure that if they're saying, this is my tree, then the onus is on them to, to step up and say, this is my tree. And, and there we go, because we do, we've had some pretty um, substantial, um, and it's difficult to know where the right-of-ways are sometimes. Colleagues, other thoughts, Mr. Uh, Goldman? Yes, uh, thanks. Uh, I wanted to clarify something. For the right-of-way permit, does the applicant need to hire their own arborist? No, I, this this is supposed to be more like a, <clears throat> a minor permit, so you don't need an arborist. Okay, so um, uh, I believe, and you could correct me if I'm wrong, but at the tree board meeting, a couple of members expressed concern that had there been a requirement to hire an arborist, that might be, you know, onerous, cost prohibitive. But if it's if it's not strictly required, I think that that's a, a good thing then. Make it, make it easier for them to apply. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Furtani. All right, thank you. And uh, th thank you, Director Venner, for a great uh, a summary. I'm just wondering on uh, 5C, uh, the or sorry, 5D, the replacement plan that provides for at least one tree replacing each remove to provide canopy coverage equal to or greater than the trees being removed. And earlier, it basically defines the canopy cover as uh, Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, it's basically uh, defined as basically um, when the tree is essentially fully grown. Um, 
is there like a database of that someplace that people could find out what the tree's canopy is going to be? Well, the, the city's tree list um, mm -hmm. predicts what the canopy is gonna, gonna be. So we, we um, use that, all, all we're, we're asking people to, to I mean, and, and, you know, and so all of my staff can do this analysis through IMAP, just, you know, they, they, they put a circle around the, the tree and estimate its canopy. So that's how we usually handle when we get an application in. We don't necessarily require the applicant to do that, even on a minor permit. If there's any question about whether that that tree, your, the re replacement tree, is going to meet that canopy, then we'll go in and do that uh, that analysis. So we keep it. We try to keep it fairly straightforward. Can, can I continue? Yeah. yeah so, sorry, I, I probably should restate the question. It was more the concern that it takes a while for the tree to reach that particular canopy coverage, and different trees, of course, reach the coverage at different rates. Right. So, um, when that plan is put together, then uh, is, is it a snapshot of thirty years in the future, fifty years in the future? The the, the, the plan for your tree. I thanks for clarifying. The, the, we, we take a snapshot of where your tree is right now, the one that you want to remove. And then, um, so we base our analysis or our, our, our review of your uh, of the uh, replacement plan on what the canopy was lost from that tree that's gonna be cut down right now. So if it's 200 square feet, you just have to uh, have a replacement plan that has uh, 200 square feet of tree at its own maturity. So, so we're not expecting you to, to to put in so many trees that it's it's 200 square feet right now. It's it's just at maturity, your replacement tree will replace that. Please. So 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 here's the reason I asked the question. The nightmare scenario to me would be then, um, let's say a bunch of people. This is not going to happen, but a bunch of uh, property owners decide to take down trees, replace them with trees that don't mature for say 70 years or such to reach that canopy coverage. So for a very for, for many decades there'll be a lot of bare spots on this map. Mm -hmm. So is is that a concern in, in instituting this or is that just not a thing that happens? Well, I mean, it's it's certainly, there's kind of a, an act of faith the way the whole tree ordinance was set up and to be in a canopy-based uh, regulation that uh, if we require you, if you, you, if you cut down a tree, we require you, we give you 30 years to replace that canopy. Um, so that was... A policy decision that was made in the first canopy-based ordinance about you know uh, eight or ten years ago, whenever that was, and and so we you know I I guess you know that that's a more fundamental question. If you want to address that, we, we might want to you know take you know use another opportunity when we're looking at the tree regulations with uh, you know less of a clock ticking, so to speak. <laughs> Just a clarifying question. In our list of what canopy a tree is that it's 30, is that supposed to be its 30 year canopy? That's supposed to be so right. so that kind of mitigates your dug fur that would have this, but we're calculating it at its 30 year estimated average canopy coverage. I think does that help uh councilman for time? Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. and, and Director Bennett, thank you very much. The the question of the the, the time frame for that is one that's pun intended, perennially have, has come up <laughs> multiple times over the years. And with each iteration of the tree ordinance, we've, we've debated that. And I think that um, it's a challenge. I, From my perspective, I look at this question of the 450 square foot canopy uh, of canopy coverage being replaced offsite shall be considered one tree. That's another kind of, it's a policy decision, but it's also one that's that we need to consider the new science because I think that was a little bit, you know, um, I think that goes back to the original. Yeah, there's 2015, I, maybe as you know, the uh, in like 2017, the, the yeah. ability to take out um, to use the fee in lieu or any type of right. development was taken out. So, so this this definition is kind of sitting unused. Right. right? Okay. And but and I and I think yeah I, I think the thing to do is kind of figure out all the other policy questions that you know are being raised and then go back and see if we still need that definition because there's some other possibilities we could uh, you know develop. Excellent suggestion. Thank you, mm -hmm. colleagues. Can we move on from this um, from okay. five to six or are we still on five? Any other questions on five? Okay, okay, so then moving on to six. Um, 
the this is the um, permit application requirements for the um, right of way corridor project permit. Uh, and um, so this is sort of a, based on what um, you might have seen uh, in the regulations related to a ut utility corridor permit uh, and that you're looking for a plan, uh, but, but we've kind of taken out this sort of long-termness of, of the utility corridor and just trying to get um, an understanding of, you know, here's what this project, yeah, it, its impacts are going to be and here's how they're going to be mitigated. So it's still um, a little bit uh, open-ended. Uh, and then we're looking for, um, you know, persuasive explanations as to why, um, you know, the the prod how the project is designed to prioritize um, healthy trees, uh, in accordance to we have like a set of criteria about um, um, trees in that section that's um, mentioned there, and then timeline for uh, the activity when you're going to remove, when you're going to replace, monitoring, maintenance, um, canopy coverage lost. Uh, and then um, a maintenance, maintenance and monitoring plan for at-risk trees. Um, and, and what if it, if it fails, what's the, uh, the fallback uh, measures? And so we're kind of defining at-risk at -risk tree is defined. Uh, it, it's an existing definition uh, that the city attorney recommended we, we use um, as um, uh, something that could, has already been established. It means a tree that is exposed to potential damage, but can be preserved during construction process uh, through strict adherence to recommendations from the city's qualified arborist, paraphrasing there. And, um, and then so, and then a right-of-way corridor replacement plan to mitigate all the uh, canopy loss from the project, uh, and as well as a maintenance plan. And the replacement plan based on the following prioritization. So this is where we get into that whole, once again, the idea of the corridor. Uh, and so the first priority, um, small Roman number one there is to, where feasible, replace in right away corridor, uh, which uh, is, we're, we're gonna referring back to that definition that we talked about earlier. Um, and means that the applicant will or has obtained private property permission, or in the case of right away, the city's permission to replant re, um, uh, in a location with conditions conducive to viable tree growth. So viable tree, another definition is already in the code. Um, and so that's priority one as, as currently written. Secondly would be where, uh, where feasible, all of these are couched in that term, which is also defined. Uh, in a uh, preferred site planting uh, areas uh, in the right-of-way cor corridor, in the right-of-way corridor permit offsite replanting guide. So we are um, planning to turn uh, the, this, this first draft of this map, that would become that right-of-way corridor guide, uh, replanting guide. Uh, and so, so those essentially, I mean, they're, they're, they're given the same weight, um, but you know, first, uh, uh, first uh, priority is still the corridor. Second, th these uh, preferred places. Third, other locations that are feasible. And then fourth, when it can be demonstrated that some portion of canopy is not feasible to re re um, replace through the, the first three priorities, then the applicant shall, shall pay a fee in lieu um, of offsite replanting for the lost canopy. And then that, that takes us back to that definition that we were talking about. And then, uh, so the just to finish off the list here, the, the so we have maps the, with the ICRZ and CRZ of uh, each tree that is to be retained, and then uh, plans for trenching. Uh, the and so that what we want to do is have a conversation between the applicants arborists and our city arborists and come to uh, mutual agreement about uh, you know uh, which trees can be. Uh, the you know, the area within the or near the ICRZ can be manipulated, which can't, which are more sensitive. Um, that uh, you know we think that conversation will be um, more productive, and uh, by having this in a plan format, you you get sort of buy off on each aspect of the plan. And then number seven here, the uh, just uh, general statement about that uh, all for all of these types of permits, they 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 will pay a fee. Uh, that uh, and. Uh, that the city council establishes. So um, anyway, uh, any questions about that? I th you know, I think um, I, I, 
I, I, I hope we can, you know, spend a, a fair amount of time just kind of seeing where everybody's at with this set of priorities. I think that's the biggest policy statement here. So, but any any questions on any, that or anything else? Thank you, Director Bennett. I, I'll I'll put a stake in the ground right now on this one. The fee and lieu thing. I don't think that honestly, I don't think it's necessary. We have two three other options here, and I think we have plenty of places that trees need to be um, located. But I'll leave it there and let you all discuss it. I think the only thing that comes to my mind is item three, replanting where feasible in other locations within the city limits. If that's other city locations or or private property locations, those may not be ready or or you know, how do you find those locations and get permission and move forward? Um, obviously, uh, some of these projects will take a long time. Some may be smaller projects uh, that don't take as long. So I guess kind of a, I guess a thought and a, not really uh, a policy direction, but just a thought. How do we handle that? And the fee and lose seems like maybe one way to handle that, but I want to make sure that we're not just putting trees because we have to get it done and they might not be in the right place or where we want or very thoughtful. So that's just what I'm trying to avoid. And fee and lieu of it both at the same time. <laughs> Thank you, Councilmember. Councilmember for Tony. <clears throat> oh, thanks. Okay, so um, my understanding is that uh, that Sound Transit would have to uh, apply for this kind of uh, would these if we were to approve these shortly, they would have to apply under these conditions. Is that correct? That's yes. That's that's kind of what's driving that particular uh, okay. set of code. So, so the reason I'm asking the question is then um, the fee and lose. Um, you know, I have two minds of this, honestly, I would like them to basically replant the trees and, you know, going through that three step process of finding uh, where the appropriate place to plant would be great. But I, you know, because I'm not certain about the number of trees they're taking, I don't know if it's necessarily practical to do it. So for that reason, the fee and lieu, we get something rather than nothing out of it. Right. So convince me one way or the other, please. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you, Councilmember. Fair enough. Uh, let I'd like to let Councilmember Goldman speak first, please. Yeah, I'm kind of in the same two sides because um, on the one hand, I think having sort of a catch-all is necessary in case you know we legitimately can't find spaces. On the other hand, I don't want to be in a situation where an applicant makes sort of like a token effort and then says, oh, we tried. So, OK, um, you know, here's a here's a check for 300 trees worth. So how do we kind of ensure that that the applicant is making kind of like a good faith effort to find locations for trees while not being overly burdensome and saying, well, you're going to have to keep searching for like six more months before you write us a check. So like, like how do we strike that balance? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Councilmember Goldman. That's a, that's my point exactly. It's sort of I I, I want to make sure we avoid the path of least resistance, and and the work is done. Councilmember Riddle. And then, of course, I think we want to avoid encumbering too much work in one, two, and three. That somebody who's an essential facility can say, "Eh, I'm not even going to do that. It's not within my job to find properties that I don't own to put plants on." So, I want to find a balance where we are encouraging the correct replanting of trees where it's actually creating value to the city by creating a good canopy coverage in those underserved canopy areas without pushing it so far that it becomes uh, a challenge and something that we, we we need to address that way. So that balance is what I'm looking for. Thank you, colleagues. And on, on point to, uh, to Mr. Goldman's comment about the number of trees we don't really it's difficult to have clarity about the specificity of which trees and number of trees that are being removed uh, in certain the various projects that may be happening, not specifically about one. Um, as we all know, that's been very difficult to to extract that um, data. And so that is the other thing that I do appreciate, Mr. Bennett, that the the clarity there about the very specific, you know, the a, a tree removal plan is is really important. Um, and so, um, anyway, I, that that's another vagary of this this discussion that we we're, we're kind of grappling with, and, and keeping in mind, of course, this is all our right of ways, not very uh, not specific to one project or another. Uh, with that, should we move on, or you want to stay with this, colleagues? Councilmember, 
just one more thought as we look at item three replanting where feasible in other locations within the city limits would there be a use to 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 mention other uh, low canopy areas within the city limits again to 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 move towards our policy of improving the canopy in those locations well that that's what um number two is which is preferred planting we we, we would um so establish something like the map that the tree board member did. And those are, for, from their perspective, those are the low canopy areas. Um, yeah, so two, two is hitting those areas within that 2,000 foot right away corridor, right? No, the, it's, it's actually the, the four squares that were kind of all over the city. Okay. Oh, so that's what they're referring, they're referring to one, two, three, yeah, four. That, yeah, if you look. Okay. Look at the map. Thank the, you, thank you. That, that didn't... Yeah, it's hard to, hard to see on, on there a little bit, but, but that was the idea. I think, I think perhaps a new a new name for that that's canopy coverage, you know, low canopy coverage yeah, reference more, guide or something why, like that. Why are they important to us? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because when I see right away corridor permit, I'm thinking of the permit, not thinking of the canopy coverage. So maybe that's my, mm -hmm. that's my advice. <laughs> One thing I, I, before we move on to something else, I wanted to just let you know that I, I talked with uh, one of the Sound Transit employees who worked with uh, City of Shoreline uh, and the other uh, link, uh, the Linwood light rail uh, uh, folks to uh, to come up with a program where uh, you know they would just say they determine here's the number of offsite trees that you know need to be replaced. And they, they came up with a few other kind of criteria. Here's how many properties uh, that trees were removed from. And so then they asked um, uh, the um, King Conservation District uh, to get involved. And they came up with a, an agreement where the King Conser Conservation District created, you know, came up with a number. Uh, this is what that's worth. And, and so I, I, I think it was like a quarter million dollars of um, tree planting funding that they would need to receive to mitigate that canopy loss. And they would base it on you know, people who came forward and ask uh, them that told them that they, they would like to replant a tree on their private property. So that takes out this whole issue of, you know, you know the applicant working uh, or the city trying to make sure that replanted trees are going to, um, you know, be viable uh, on private property. The, I'm still, you know, getting the, in, uh, you know, to, to know the whole program uh, uh, well enough to really write about it, how we might put it in code. Um, but but it does sound like a way where, uh, you know, you have this third party eight, uh, entity who is all about conservation and education. And, and so they are uh, not only making sure that these replacement trees are viable, but they're educating property owners at the same time through that process, like they've done in the, um, the projects that they, we've had here in, in Lake Forest Park. So, um, you know, if, if there's uh, interest in that, we could continue to pursue that as a way to not only address the in lieu aspect, but also does it facilitate more planting in private property on those, those, uh, those uh, areas of preference or in the corridor itself, just by facilitating um, that relationship between the property owner. We, we don't have to know exactly where the trees are gonna be planted. We just say, okay, in, in the corridor, you're going to plant this many trees on this many properties. That's the goal. And uh, KC has um, two years, three years to do it. Um, so, so I'll help to look into that a little bit more. Thank you, Director Bennett. I personally love the idea. And it also kind of fixes my question about the fee and lieu uh, conundrum, if you will, mm -hmm. you know, sort of paying their way to get out of what they need to do because agencies will do that or or individuals will do that. And the other thing I was just thinking about the conversation we had at a previous meeting, the city does have all these properties around the community that um, that need additional tree uh, coverage. But at the same time, the preparation for that because of the removing the invasives, et cetera, can be could be onerous as well. And that's not part of that you know, fee. Right. So this could be a, a great way to to go. Colleagues, thoughts about Director Bennett's idea about KCD? I, I'd like to know more. Yeah, I think I'd like to know more about that. Yeah, I, I really like the idea. And I also like the fact that your third party is going to have a lot more experience with what's successful and what's not successful. So I like that. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, great. Hey, thank you, everybody. I, Steve, that's a great idea. I, I really like it. Okay, good. Well, yeah, we'll continue to look into that. So, um, and the uh, the next section, if uh, there's no further comments um, through the uh, bottom of page um, 12, would be the sections related to what we need to have to uh, approve these permits. So that's uh, all part of this 070 tree permit approval uh, criteria and conditions. And so we you know, address all the various different types of permits. And so we have these two new um, types of permits, the right of way, uh, the, the individual right of way tree. We need to find that the tree, um, that one of these applies. So it's a, 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 either the tree is physically dam is physically damaging structures, um, two that's in such poor health or poor vigor that uh, removal is justified, three it's invasive, four uh, it cannot be successfully retained due to unavoidable conflicts with private public development. So that's the most likely thing to happen. You need to put in a driveway, uh, and the tree is in the way, and there's no other place to put it. Uh, it's not an exceptional tree, but you know, so that that gives us the ability to prove that that viable removal of that tree because th this is really the only way that you can get the driveway to the house. Um, and so the other ones, you know, it's, it's the other ones are sort of setting up the the situations in the critical areas regulation. There has to be something wrong with the tree before we talk about uh, removing it. And and that that's the same thing can happen with critical area that the tree is uh, in in the way of development that could otherwise be approved through a um, critical areas permit. So any thoughts about um, those criteria? Colleagues. Questions? That's for Goldman. Yeah, um, thanks for prescribing that. I kind of have, a, it's related to it. I'm, I'm kind of taking this from the retaining wall discussion that we had. Um, feedback from the public was that they would want to be involved in at least knowing about projects that are being applied for. And so what sort of mechanism would there be for the public to know, okay, so, yep. Yeah, if it's Sound Transit or some other applicant has put forward their corridor plan, uh, notifying you know relevant members of the public. Um, mm -hmm. I think I think that was a question. Yeah, that's <laughs> that, that's no, I, I I took it as a question. The um and and that's that's kind of um the, in the context you're talking about that's more related to age. But I think uh, you know it's still a an important decision by the council. What do you want to do in the case of G? which is, do you treat it like um, a minor permit where you just have to post your notice uh, for two days uh, that you, you have a notice of application? You know, I've applied to remove this tree and you have people a chance to comment or you treat it like a major permit uh, where you just, and this was, you'd still just be posting the site uh, for 14 days this time though. And, and, or, and then in the case of, we have some tree removal situations where you have to send uh, the notice out to people within 300 feet because it's removing over 50% uh, of the canopy or a couple other conditions. So, so that's sort of the, on the local permit level. And then um, on the, the corridor permit level, uh, I, don't, I don't know that we've really figured, we we're presenting any kind of um, uh, proposal as far as notice. Uh, do you recall, uh, City Attorney Pratt, whether we came up with a notice requirement? I do not. I was just trying to find the existing provision because that is what would apply by default. Yeah, there's the this this ordinance general refers to 20, the 1626 or our you know land use process uh, ordinance when when something triggers a special kind of review. So. Um, it, it, that's really what would be involved, just like we had this discussion the other night about, is this a level, is this is ministerial, is it a level three, or do we want to, you know, go uh, greater than that? Um, so uh, that would, uh, in addition to um, any questions or comments about those criteria, uh, as we talk about both of these sections, and maybe I'll just, why don't I just finish kind of talking about these and then we can talk about them together because they're kind of levels of degree. So with the, the right-of-way corridor uh, project um, permit applicants, we got to find that the applicant um, is either uh, proposes or is conditioned to satisfy the following, which is that it adequately addresses, the, the proposal adequately addresses the, um, uh, the, uh, the design is that it's less that uh, rather than 
there's no other alternative with less impact on tree preservation. And secondly, it meets all the other uh, application requirements uh, in the other section, and that uh, the, it will result in the replacement of the canopy lost. Um, and then it addresses the issues with trenching, uh, and uh, there's a maintenance and monitoring plan uh, for those at-risk trees that, the, uh, that have been identified through the process. So, um, so there's, you know, that, that's just essentially setting up, um, uh, it's really just reflecting what was already talked about in the, the other section about this. Um, and so, um, you know, these two proce processes uh, are what gives the city arborist the kind of the check up, check, you know, check this has gotten taken care of, this has gotten taken care of. Um, and then, of course, there's the noticing question as well. So either whichever way you want to go with that, we could talk about uh, these specific pr provisions or just talk about notice in general. It's up to you. Colleagues, I'd recommend we start with G, uh, the right-of-way tree permits, and then go to the quarter project permits discreetly. That's acceptable to everybody. I apologize. I'm, my allergies are destroying my voice. Thoughts about G? Councilmember Goldman. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, uh, and I apologize. I think I may have asked my question a little prematurely. Um, yeah, I, I think for G, if that's the sort of like, okay, taking down one tree to kind of extend your driveway, that strikes me as, yeah, as more of a minor tree permit. So I think that's probably fine as it, yeah, just as treating it as whatever the notice is for a minor tree mm -hmm. permit. Okay. Thank you, council member. Colleagues, other thoughts on G? Uh, I'll weigh in and say, I concur with you. I think that's, that, I think that makes a lot of sense. The corridor permitting is, is a different question. Let's move on to H. This is a big one. <laughs> Council Member Golden, please lead. Um, again, so this is kind of what I was asking before, that I think this is the one where members of the public are going to be very interested on, you know, how many trees are being removed, where are they going? So this feels like there should be a higher level of notice. And maybe I think we were discussing type three at, with retaining walls, we're sort of like a 300 foot radius that I think strikes me as a reasonable place. Um, I'm open to other ideas, but yeah, that strikes me as a, as a good place to start. Councilmember Riddle. Sorry, here you go. Thank you. Um, not sure about the overall impact this would have, but if our replanting area is 2000 feet in width, it almost feels like you wanna notice where you would be replanting for this large of a project. And that's a lot of people, but if you aren't involved in the decision making at the early stages, and then they come in and say, we want to plant trees on your property, you'd be like, wait, what? What's going on? It just seems like getting all the people who may be involved in that noticed early would make the transition to planting in those areas easier. And on point um, of both of you, uh, Director Bennett, so when we're talking about a corridor permit, I would assume it would be 300 feet to either side of of the whatever proposed or around the project okay yeah so you know that could be very large depending on what we're, we're talking about here right so uh but on point is that um within what you're thinking councilman riddle when it comes to notification uh if we're talking about planting for a wider area. And I think maybe we can reconsider kind of what that kind of notic notification outside the 300 foot might be just, you know, posting signage in the neighborhoods where people, because you know you're, you're going up and down those streets. Maybe it's not as um, onerous as, you know, posting literally to every person. It's just an, an alert. I know that probably we at the city will, will support uh, spreading the word anyways, but we don't want to rely on ourselves. The applicant has to do this themselves. So maybe there's a some sort of a different type of notification between our 300 foot notification range and then out to that full 2000 in width um we could think about what that would look like post this many 
signs, you know, for, for uh, every year linear or uh, foot of, of it that, that are along the perimeter or something like that. Okay. Yeah. Um, did somebody get back here have a hand raised to staff? Mayor? No? Okay. Yes, so make sure. Councilmember Fertani, you haven't weighed in. Did you have any thoughts about this? I mean, I, I concur with what's been said, so didn't have any thought to add. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. So, um, and by the way, I just wanted to mention that we did, it seems Director Bennett and Kim, we had, Ms. Pratt, we had a, a question back in town center or some other area where the question of notification beyond just the, a certain, certain area was considered sort of egregious or Am I mistaken about that? I can't remember. Well, what I think you ended up uh, adopting a provision that said everybody in town, okay, uh, all property owners will be notified. Okay, maybe it was there was the concern that was expressed. It could be egregious, but we, I guess we prevailed. So <laughs> I'm forgetting, unless I'm mis, uh, misremembering that. So, any other thoughts on on uh, uh, H quarter considerations? Okay. Um, all right. We're pretty close to the. I think we're at the end. Yeah, uh, that, I think that's it. I just wanted up. to let you know we might also have one more change to a new section, an additional section, which is deals with tree maintenance. It's in one ten. It's not in part of your ordinance yet. But essentially, if it, you know, it says that uh, all the pruning of uh, street trees uh, uh, is has to be supervised by the public works um, maintenance people, and so we may want to you know, find a different way to approach that because if, if we're going to be encouraging people to to plant street trees that it, maybe that doesn't have to be the case. <laughs> I don't think our, we can stretch our public works uh, sure. that far, but so so that you may see that one and uh, we'll try to give you some options to work with on that. Yeah, I, I, what you said just made me think um, if if the goal is to replant in the right of way, there's oftentimes utilities and so forth there. Do we have any specific provisions for um, citing or for verifying, especially if a homeowner is gonna do it themselves rather than through a development? Um, or if they just, if someone just wants to increase the beauty of their street front and add a tree, like how do we, how do we make sure that they don't interfere with, with utilities? Well, um, we don't, usually get involved if they just want to plant uh, landscaping or vegetation. Uh, but if they want to put some sort of permanent improvement, uh, it, it triggers a right-of-way permit application, uh, you know, for safety concerns as well. So, um, you know, everybody's always encouraged to call before they, they dig. Uh, but usually, um, you know, the uh, we haven't, as far as I know, had a lot of situations where planting a street tree really um you know interfere with any of the utilities but uh that probably is something we should uh, all be aware of yeah and maybe that's some language just to have in the documentation for for the applicant just to know and be aware of right. that they can call and and get help if they don't know where the utilities are right okay okay all right well thank you all for thank you director bennett any other questions for mr bennett before step society has been up there a long time <laughs> <laughs> thank you Thank you, Steve. <laughs> sure appreciate it. Uh, so colleagues, uh, we're gonna be bringing this back certainly. Um, so we have our other uh, two members of the council in the mix to talk particularly about the various uh, subjects here. And there's a bunch of them that I have bookmarked here, including level of permit. Um, let me see, what are we, where what was I here? Um, yeah, the question of G and H, whether, you know, uh, minor permits, quarter permits, whether what the level is in terms of notification and what it is in terms of administrative, the, the level of decision making. I'd like to hear our colleagues' uh, thoughts about that if you concur. Um, coming back, and then I think we have a pretty good um, approach here. Are there any other final thoughts you want to touch on here on uh, about tree permits? Just a, a, do we have a, a target deadline that we want to have this uh, in front of us for approval? That is an excellent question. And just a reminder, we're not doing anything. Um, this is not about a specific project. It's about the quarters in general and right of ways. So 
Um, I would expect that we'd be bringing this back for counts to council probably. Mr. Hill, thoughts on that? I'm guessing we'll have this conversation again, first of June-ish and then action mid late June. Was it the 8th and the 23rd of June, something like that. Um, I think you have your meeting on the 5th dedicated to walls, so. Um, Mr. Goldman. Um, also on timeline, uh, would there be a public hearing associated with this? Mr. Ben is nodding in, in the affirmative, so uh, we would have to do that as well. So we're going to have a meeting uh, this week on scheduling, and we will make sure we get this into the pipeline and, and uh, get it moved forward as quickly as possible, given the urgency of some various things bearing down on us, as well as time, time constraints relative to uh, our rest of our schedule, which is pretty, pretty full. So uh, any other thoughts on topic? Okay, thanks everybody. All right, let's, uh, we only have about 20 minutes here to move on to governance manual. And we were, um, with, with the absence of our, a couple of our colleagues here, we <clears throat> will have to revisit some of these things later, but, um, and again, just a reminder to everyone out there who will watch this meeting later, um, we have put some of these things that are nice to do, uh, so to speak, um, on the back burner because of the must do's, uh, as it were, this year. And it seems like there's a lot of must do's. So let's see, uh, if I recall correctly, we were, we had just, last note I had was on page 42. Uh, we stopped at five, 5.6. And again, um, if I if I may, let's not try to relitigate some of the earlier sections, if if at all possible. Uh, we can certainly, if you want to ha have some thoughts, you're more than welcome to send them to me uh, offline. As always, don't hit, you know, send it to the whole council. But let's find a way to um, move forward with this so we can get um, ensure that the um, the very good is not the enemy, or the perfect is not the enemy of the very good. <laughs> So thoughts on, on point, Councilman Riddle. I don't have notes in article, much in article five. Did I just not take notes or I don't remember talking five. about it. Was I sleeping through something? Because that would be really bad. Um, yeah, we, we've got notes here, okay. five-year cycle, Robert's rules, okay. a bunch of other things. My, Did we, we might've gone through it fast. This is this is the vagaries of picking up something at the eleventh hour, folks. So, um, I'm just curious if my colleagues are also remembering us going over that section or not. We did because we have. I know we did because Robert's rules lay on the table. We we talked about the um, consideration for vetoes, etc. Council deliberations. Let's we'll start. Look at Article Five and see if there's things here that I'm mistaken that I'm... <laughs> Maybe I was just getting ahead of myself here. I thought I made all my... We had this whole thing... Sorry. Um, Please. We this whole thing about motion. Yeah, thank you, Councilor Fertani. I was, I was on... Page 42 is where I my recollection was and my notes were. Um, where we left that was uh, amendments, amendments to ordinances and resolutions. The note I had was tighten up um, relative to, you know, the question of, um, you know, something that's brought on the fly or actually prepared well and advanced. So, um, any thoughts on 5.6? And again, colleagues, if, the, if this is too much of a big a, a, a shift between topics, which it is a big mental shift for me, honestly, <laughs> because I've been deep into, into trees and, and uh, uh, um, right away things, um, you know, don't hesitate to, to express your uh, questions. 
some of these things, 5.7, for example, are, are pursuant to RCWs. Um, th those things are, um, are very specific and we cannot change those. Okay, so let's just get, Councilmember Goldman, please. Um, yeah, I had comment uh, for section 5.6, I had sort of commented in the margin that I like the idea of having a more formal amendment process you know, I, I think the discussion can very quickly get confusing if people are sort of making amendments on the fly and then, you know, wordsmithing their amendments on the fly. So if we can encourage people to at least get their amendments submitted a couple of days in advance, okay. that way, you know, that way we everybody knows what we're going to be discussing. Staff has a chance to make sure that the amendment actually accomplishes what the submitter wants it to accomplish. Excellent. Oops, I didn't have my mic on. I apologize. Councilmember Rupp. I would just say that if we do, it would be nice if we do have an on the fly amendment, especially if it's rather short, that we have some way of having a written description presented, especially since we have the hybrid option, uh, because then it's very clear what we're all voting on. Uh, and, and in the past, we didn't always have that option. But I think uh, with our city clerk, maybe we can do that. Um, and I think that might be something we should we should encourage, if not require. Okay. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Mr. Hill, apologies. <clears throat> it's okay. Your head Here. is down, oh. you were writing. Um, you know, in past practice, another experience as well is for council to take like a five minute recess while the staff crafts what we've been told, prints it, hands it out to council members, provides it to the public, gets it up on the screen. I mean, that is an option as well. Just take that recess. If something comes up on the fly and there's agreement of consensus, we can do that as well. Thank you, Mr. Hill. And I that brings up a, a great distinction to um, the mayor and I would, would ha both have recollections of this. Five minute recess for staff is very different than a five minute recess for commiseration by policymakers, if you remember, Jeff. So yeah, we. I want to make sure that is very distinct. So if it's a direction by the policy body to, um, for staff to, um, you know, uh, craft something that that is amenable to everyone on the in the in the group, then that's great. Um, but I I really want to make sure we limit it to staff because that's a that's a place where we don't want to go one as policymakers stepping into the back, writing something together and then coming back. Um, it's very different if staff asks for assistance with uh, specific words that a, a policymaker said, but that should be done like at this desk or, you know, not. Okay. <laughs> we all know what we're talking about. Does that make sense to you all? <laughs> Thank you. Great, thank you very much. I think the spirit of this is very, quite solid and I appreciate the work that was got, done in the past by uh, um, our colleagues before us. Yes, Councilmember Riddle. Um, has this been reviewed by the, the mayor and the staff to be, do they have any comments or questions being that this is about them? Fair, fair enough, I, I would assume that they've had a chance to look at it. <laughs> 
um, is, it's available. I, I think actually the mayor helped write part of this yeah. back in the day. Yeah. So <laughs> I, <laughs> yeah, yeah. thanks, man. Um, I, I really, um, again, we would certainly, this is, again, we're, we're going to go through this on a, if the administration has additional thoughts, we can certainly incorporate them to the mix. Mr. Hill, please. Is, we're talking about article six. Is that okay? Yes, yeah. I, I checked once early on, I'll double check it, but I believe this is exactly what's codified in our, in I think it's title two. Um, but I'll double check that and make sure that okay. they that they align. Council member for time. Quick question for those of us who don't know what Title II is. Is that a state, federal? Local. And where are these found? It's our municipal code that oh. you can find on the website. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah, so keep in mind when we revise this, the, yeah, the, we, they're very specific things that we have to be cognizant of, and Title II is definitely one of them. So thank you for the clarification, Mr. Hill. Um, let's see. So. Risk management. Uh, and again, 6.7 public information is enhanced by audio, video, and website and note and access. We could beat this one to death. I, I think this is one that we're going to have to just bookmark for future, unless somebody wants to jump in and add all the different additional mediums that have been come into play since 2013. <laughs> um, I Yes, I, I agree. I, I think probably this one will get a bit more generic rather than more specific. Um, I like where it's going. And I think the as long as we focus on the intent of accessibility of our of our work at the city's yeah. work and, and um, accessibility of the public to engage, I think then we're OK, <laughs> but we can hold on that for later. OK, well, if anybody has any thoughts about just really generic kind of wording here, please feel free to shoot me an email. We can we can look at it and uh, see if we can make it sort of simpler um, because that one this is one you could take a you know an hour on um and um okay so the first the next one that we have suggestions from i think it was councilman goldman and councilman cassover um well so councilman cassover commented on 6.8 that it needs review and discussion um as this has not been the practice. So, um, and on point, it's, it says the mayor and the court council recognize the value of city of the city speaking with one voice and have agreed that unless specifically otherwise determined, the administration will prepare written responses to, to originally said citizens to the public. Um, and again, I think many, much of this is very accurate. The administration will make every reasonable ever to respond with, to all written correspondence addressed to the mayor and council and copy the council within 14 days of receipt. Response to verbal testimony by the administration will be at the specific request of the council. The city administrator will report on correspondence from the administration between council meetings in his or her report. Copies of such responses should be provided to the council in the next meeting packet. Mr. Hill has been exceptionally good at carboning in us as well as staff have on responses to the public. Um, the question here, colleagues, and again, without, we have just a few minutes tonight, but I just would say if there may be a way to tighten this up from the standpoint of making sure that the, the flow of information is uh, consistent with what the expectations of the policy making group is, um, I want to make sure that if there's something lacking in this description, then let's 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 update it. Um, um, and so the the next part here, of course, it says, and this is really hard to read. Uh, in addition to an official response by the administration, wow, okay. Oh, I'm sorry, individual count. Thank you, individual council member. Council member, it should be. This yeah, there's a typo here. There's, there should be an individual council member or a council member is or are welcome to respond to the public, so long as it's clear that this these 
or these responses may not re represent the official position of the city uh, and may not represent the official position. See, so this one definitely needs to be tightened up. Um, I'm sorry, Mr. Hill. And it wasn't to this point. So if you want to finish this thought. Yeah. And um, Council Member Furtani, if if uh, and, and and others on uh, the first the first paragraph, I think it may be speaking a little bit more to the purpose of of why we speak with one voice and you know and the transparent government transparency and things. I think that would be useful if you could bring some language like that. I'd appreciate to see that for review. Thank you, Council Member Riddle. Do that. Yeah, I mean, I I, th I think this is. It, illustrates the vagaries of trying to edit something rather than rewrite it. So, <laughs> Mr. Hill, please. Just back to Council Member Cassover's point. I think the point that I heard and I want to clarify is that while the communication the administration has been doing has been carboning all the, the council members, I think her point was that she'd like to see that reflected in the CA report um, on occasion. And so uh, that we can easily do. And so. Thank you for the reminder. That is, was exactly what she said, um, and I think it's it, it's really helpful to all all of us and the citizens to have that, you know, so that they all know that the response has been sent out and and not lost in translation. Okay, thank you, Councilmember uh, Furtani. Um, Six point nine City Clerk minutes public information access. Um, again, RCWs, we're 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 kind of a you know. It is what it is, unless anybody has real <laughs> specifics. Mr. Lebo looks like he wants to put a stake in the ground right here. I can tell. <laughs> <laughs> Just uh, again, unless there's unless there's anything uh, that has been updated in the RCW or th our clerk has any concerns, I'm good with what's yeah. here so far. Well, I, I think the administration and our clerk does a, a fantastic job there, so I'm, I'm quite comfortable with this, regardless of the government's manual. Um, okay. Are we comfortable moving on to uh, Article 7? Just, yep. just as a minor, um, it does refer to audio recordings. So again, I think perhaps making this more generic again, uh, so we don't have to keep updating it for different technologies. Okay. All right. Thank you. Passover, you have a thought? Uh, just generally include, I think it just shall include, um, unless, because uh, I imagine we're possibly different for special meetings, but I think for council business meetings, it shall include a public comment, it should be pretty standard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's, that's been our, our practice, and it's it actually, and, thank you. Yeah. Um, yes, Councilman Goldman. Something I'm curious about, so we generally have the public comment near the beginning of the meeting, which I like. Do we have, like, let's say a bunch of people show up late, to the, like we had public comment from 710 to 720, a bunch of people arrive at 730, is there a mechanism for allowing them to comment if they want? Thank you for that, Councilmember Goldman. You know, we've had a couple of circumstances where we've had a situation where the we've had like a, a work session, I'm trying to think of what, I, I can't think of specifics, but We've had a work session and people got confused about when they should be here and various things have happened. I really believe it should be the public comment should be, a, and we can always modify the agenda, but I really think it should be more explicitly defined within the governance manual to say that the chair uh, should be able to, with the, with the acquiescence or the, or the push from the policy group, um, be able to move public comment earlier or later as we did recently because we had we had some really you know please 
or even perhaps like add a second public comment period. It, like if people, if public comment has already been closed for the meeting and then additional people arrive, second, yeah, it, yeah, yeah, give the chair the ability to open a, like a, a new public comment window for people who didn't get a chance. I appreciate that. Colleagues, other thoughts? I think that would be a good flexibility to have. Thank you, Mary. Libo, please. My preference would be that uh, public comments is, is at the beginning of the meeting as early as possible. Um, as to opening it up for additional public comment later, I think that would be, um, we should really go through the process. The council amends the agenda to incorporate that rather than just at the discretion of the chair that's Absolutely. running the meeting. Yeah, it would have to be for no matter yeah. yeah. Mr. Fertoni. And thank you. And the case in point was today, we had a member of the audience and uh, I was kind of wondering what was on our mind, but we didn't have a mechanism by which we could right. uh, solicit that comment. Thank you. Um, okay, we got have some thoughts here. Let's see. All right, other meetings with the public outside of City Hall, additional avenues for public participations. Um, commissions. <laughs> We're at 728. I, I'm not sure we have. Yeah. Um, no, I, th I think we've, uh, you know, just food for thought uh, for our next discussion. We, I think that there's been a lot of good work that's gone into this, and I don't think there's a whole lot that we just need to, it just needs to be updated. And um, Councilmember Goldman, Councilmember uh, um, Cassover, <clears throat> excuse me, brought a bunch of things in here and it's just, um, you see it in blue. Well, let's just go through it really quickly and, and I will book, I'll put a, a line here at 7374 for next meeting. We'll start at seven, at seven four, but let's talk about seven four just quickly, just to get the juices flowing. Go ahead. I, I did have an additional thought around, um, public comment participation for one, two, and three. Um, we oftentimes include public comment in budget and finance meetings and other things like that, which we don't really have codified anywhere as a standard, it's something we do, but it's not part of, I think, our governance manual, if I recall correctly, as well as, um, you know, we do other meetings that are at City Hall, but 7.2 refers to public outside of City Hall. So I think we just need to massage this language to be more relevant to what we actually do. We do different kinds of meetings in City Hall, plus we do meetings outside of City Hall, all of which may have a public comment as part of their agenda. Mm. So I think it's just a clarity there would be useful. Okay. Thank you for that, Councilman Rule. We are, you know, it is my uh, fervent hope that we're going to be able to include examples of each type of uh, agenda for each meeting. Uh, as part of the governance manual before we adopt it. So that will be part of it, but we can certainly make sure the list here is uh, inclusive as well uh, of, you know, the types of meetings that public comment is, is, can be considered at. A reminder that, and, and Matt is, is uh, has been reminding me of this quite a, while, quite a bit that special meetings and there are various meetings that we have to make sure that we have very specific things on the agenda and you can add things too. So um, we encountered that in the past. Yeah, I would appreciate perhaps a, a reference to special meetings can only take public comment okay. if it's in the agenda. Okay. So that that's something that helps us. Councilmember Goldman. Uh, related to that, I mean, I'd like to see that as the default that when we have a special meeting, if it's a special, business meeting and you know if there's public comment in a regular business meeting there should be public comment in a special business meeting or if there would be public comment in a regular cow there should be public comment in a special cow 
I'm going to, I'm going to disagree with you a little bit on this one. And that is because sometimes when we have a special meeting and I'm not going to disagree with you, it's, it's more of a, you know, just part of point of clarification, Larry, when we have a special meeting, sometimes it's because we have to get some work done. And sometimes when it, we have to get the work done, we have a very, um, a topic that is, has considerable uh, emotional component to the community, community. And if we take public comment, sometimes we end up not being able to do the work we need to do. So the question is, how do we incorporate that in the special meeting when we have to have a very discreet set of things? And if we take public comment and it takes 90 minutes of a two-hour meeting, I, I just I'm just trying to find a balance honestly, because we've encountered that before. So I, I completely agree public comment is essential. I just want to make sure that there's opportunities for if we have to do the work or whoever has to do the work as a, as a group, we, we are not distracted or encumbered by, we have 10 minutes of actual work time. <laughs> so sometimes that happens. It happens and it, and it has happened. So any other thoughts on that? Because we're for time. So just a couple. Thank you. Um, is that uh, what do, does the chair have the ability to uh, knock down the period of public comment from uh, per speaker to two minutes or one minute? Uh, governance manual usually allows that. So, and I think under state statute, I think we're allowed to do that as well. Right. Too. So maybe. So that's one option, right? Okay. Right. Yeah. Sure. And and the other option is that um, if uh, if this uh, if we can't we we are not able to limit the speakers to just people who sign up on the sheet right you, you, we we have to solicit comment from even people who haven't signed up that's correct okay got it thank you yeah thank you i mean i, I and again mr hill am i can we could tell us more of it i know you're well versed in this yeah i mean the reason for the sign up sheet is so we get so we can call on the people who signed up we have the correct spelling of their name a lot of times it increases the topic, but we've always done a call for anybody else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the mayor's done that. So. Yeah, I, I, I was actually thinking about the question of whether, you know, sort of outside of. Yeah, uh, I mean, other public agencies aren't quite so nice. They, uh, you have to have signed up ahead of time. You know, yeah, just, just real quick. Yeah, and, you know, Mr. Mayor. About half the about half the sign up sheet generally has a no next to them. They don't want to talk. So that's what's kind of interesting because almost sometimes the whole meeting signed in. I just have to look and see who wants to talk and who doesn't want to talk. But then when you get to the end, the people that put no want to talk now. So that's how that works. So. <laughs> yeah, I think I think language like where feasible and things of that nature, I think is uh, some flexibility, but it shows that the intent is for us to allow public comment and sure. as many venues, as yeah. many opportunities as possible. And I think that's what we want to portray in this section. Fair enough. Yeah, I thank you, everybody, and um, from the administration as well. I, I appreciate that. I think it's really important. I just, I'm just trying to figure out, make sure we can get the work done, <laughs> because uh, Matt and I have had actually a couple of emails back and forth on making sure what is public comment, no com comment. Do we have the time? So, uh, folks, we are past our actually allotted time, Mr. Furtoni. I don't intend to extend this meeting, but uh, since we were talking about 7.4, yeah. I have a 7.41 uh, on my copy of the, uh, um, is is that necessary since we just passed an ordinance on it? Or uh, let's see, it's the turning, the, turning the page, is everybody, 7.41, um, That's right. We put this in just in case um, that, you know, yeah, so the ordinance has been modified. And although I don't think it's, I think it's nice to have it in there. I mean, why not? It, it, I don't, it, it, as long as it's not in conflict, right. let's just, let's just call it out. Um, unless anybody else has a, a, a you know, a differing opinion. Councilman Rowe? It's, I think just maybe just making it more vague and referring back to perhaps the other section, um, talking more about the intent and the purpose is why we're encouraging this um, versus being too prescriptive so that we don't have to keep updating it if the other sure. document gets updated. But I, I appreciate it being here is, is showing our support in this. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a great I think it's great to have a deep bench, as the mayor says. So that's very cool. Um, let's see. How many more pages do we have, actually? 
You know what? Let's, uh, with the acquiescence of the group, are you all willing to go for a couple more minutes and just plow through this? And then we will come back with our colleagues when they. I would offer that um, we'd be better serve with our colleagues. Okay. It's, it's, uh, it's all already right. 730. Fair uh, enough. Okay. Just want to offer enough. one comment about public period. There's not a requirement that we have to hear everyone, although it is desirable to hear from the public at any opportunity. Sure. But um, we can prescribe a time limit. In fact, it does say in here within the time limit. So just don't want to give the impression that we have to hear everyone if we don't think that that's going to be appropriate for us to do our business. Well, as, as Billy Crystal said, uh, have fun storming the castle. <laughs> um, yeah, okay, so we'll start with Article 8, and then we'll back up a little bit to for our colleagues just to make sure that they have an opportunity to weigh in. And um, any other thoughts before we adjourn? Do you That's have a sense of when we might come back to this? I can't remember what agenda it's on next. Uh, it is not on an agenda okay. next because we keep preempting it because of... Uh, Trees and walls. So <laughs> I'm wondering if we can't get through, if it would be appropriate to request getting uh, updates through 7.4 kind of done, perhaps at least first draft done before we get back into it, just because it's getting so hard to read. And or yeah. at least through six, since we did seven without our colleagues. I just a thought, like if we can get a chunk revised that yeah by the so. end of the week i think i'll have a better sense of the next uh, six weeks or so there's just okay. there's a lot of emergent things on of course <laughs> yeah. anyway thank you appreciate Council your Rome. consideration yeah no my pleasure um colleagues is there anything else for the good of your we're yeah Council just Rome. a scheduling question our yes. meeting this thursday is does it start at seven or six because i thought there might be a special work session before the meeting uh mr hill I, if i recall correctly we are seven o'clock on thursday correct no no special anything yeah okay all right thanks everybody uh we're adjourned